into a subject which is very dear to the university's heart and should be very dear to yours, and that is your brain. And that's what Eric Bennett is going to talk to you about right now. Great. Good morning, everybody. Um, while you're filing in, all I need you to do is give me a show of hands. Uh, who did not brush their teeth this morning? Come on. Everyone, okay, thank you for one honest person. One person did not brush their teeth this morning. That's awesome. Now, how many of you guys raise your hand if you did something to make your brain healthier this morning before you got here? What'd you do? That's good. Like two other examples. Listen to some music. That's good. Let's get, pick one more. Great. Those are all three good examples. So the interesting and emerging field in the brain world is what can we do to make our brain perform better? And it's not something people think a lot about. So brain health is way behind heart health. And it's starting to catch up, though. So there's, there's things all of us can do to make our brains healthier, both from an emotional and stress-related perspective, but also a performance-related perspective. A lot of people don't think of their brain as a performance machine that they can have some control over. It. They think of this thing as it's just there, and you're just kind of there to deal with it. But a lot of things have happened. And there's a lot of things we've learned that uh, I'm going to share with you today that can make your brain perform better, and it's, and it's pretty darn exciting. Uh, uh, I'm a business guy. I spent 25 years in financial services, and um, I've been lucky enough for the past four years to be part of the Center for Brain Health. They needed someone with some business background to help them grow, and uh, so I've had this unique window into this whole world of brain science and the future of the brain, and I'm going to share that with you today, and uh, I just feel lucky to be a part of it. And so one thing that was just gnawing at me when I was in the business world is, is you know, I was really obsessed with how do, how do people reach their potential, how do organizations reach their potential, and I stopped when I, when I learned about the Center for Brain Health, and I said, well, how can we do any of that if we're not using our brain to our potential? So that became, that became a fascinating journey for me. So the, the brain world today is we are at the, the, the next great scientific and healthcare frontier is the brain. There's not a lot of debate about that in the healthcare world. Uh, we are way, way behind. It's almost demoralizing. I mean, our life expectancies are growing substantially. We're doing heart, cancer, all of them are making great strides on. The brain's way behind. Uh, Ken Cooper here in Dallas came out with his aerobics and cardio in the 60s. Uh, but before he came out with that, no one thought aerobics would be healthy. And I don't know if a lot of you guys know this, but he almost lost his medical license over it, and people compared him to Hitler because he was going to kill more people than Hitler with this cardiovascular thing that was going to make people have heart attacks and die. And uh, I don't think we're going to have that hard of a time to convince people to do healthy things for their brain as he had, but obviously now cardio is very important to heart health. So it is the great next frontier, and you're seeing more and more money going towards it, both philanthropically and government, and more interest going to it. And as you know, where money follows great research and where great research comes great ideas that can actually help people. Now, the problem has been in the brain world is we've been stuck in the past for a long time. Uh, I talked to a lot of, uh, of uh, neurosurgeons, neurologists, uh, uh, neuroscientists, psychologists, and we've been stuck in this therapy and medication world for over 30 years when it deals with the brain. And there's nothing wrong with therapy, and there's nothing wrong with medication, it's great. But we have not, in their opinions, made any material advancements up until the past five years ago on the brain. And uh, it's exciting to see some of the stuff that's coming out that can help people. Um, so I think we're gonna start seeing an industrial revolution of the brain in the next five to 10 years. I hope it comes sooner. But I, the stuff I've been able to see is just fascinating that's coming out. And part of the reason I joined the Center for Brain Health is I, I need to help get this out to more people. Because the great minds that create the science aren't the great ones to get it out to people. It's just a whole different skill set. Uh, and that's why I talk about this thing called the valley of death. This is a term that scientists use in whether it's any sort of science. Is they do this great research paper, and they find this new um, uh, 
device in, in healthcare, they might find a new metal, a new way to, something better than carbon uh, uh, for uh, bicycle frames or, or anything. And they, they don't know what to do with it once they discover it because the business people don't want to invest in it until it's been proven to a certain level. And so there's this valley here, they call the valley of death of idea to where investors will be interested that it's really hard to fund and the government doesn't like to fund it and investors don't like to fund it. So a lot of our great science gets stuck on a shelf. I talked to a guy from Ireland that says, I've got 30 ideas that I could, if I had the right backing and the right business minds, I could help people within a year on the brain. But he didn't know what to do with it because he's a scientist. Uh, and the movement has begun. So it's really exciting to be watching it firsthand as some of these first fields emerge. And UT Dallas is, is, is one of the leaders in it. And the Center for Brain Health is part of UT Dallas, but they're doing some interesting stuff all across the board. Uh, I'm going to get the bad news out of the way. Uh, all of us at about age 45 start to go into a cognitive decline. Um, it's, it, if you haven't, if once you hit about you know, 45 or 50, you probably start to feel it. Um, now, and on the flip side, our, age, our life expectancy keeps going up. I mentioned the heart health. You know, that's going up, so our life expectancy go, keeps going up. But who wants to be 110 and can't get around on their own because they can't think, right? So we're going to change that. You know, the scientists are going to change that. The world, and, and we're going to be exposed to things where this doesn't have to be true. Maybe it can go slightly down, but doesn't have to go down as fast because there are things that we all can be doing today to slow down that growth, slow down the decline. Now, one of the things we have to do is redefine a little bit about what SMART is. Uh, we, you know, the IQ test was developed, I think, over 100 years ago. So you know, most people, and my kids are in, in high school and college, and so it's like, if you have a great SAT score and awesome grades, you're smart and have a lot of potential. Um, uh, so in a high IQ, right, are people often um, praised highly for that. And there's nothing wrong with having all those skills. You know, my son does really well in school and does well on standardized test scores and things come naturally easy to him. And that's great, for the, it's the opposite for my daughter. She struggles, but she does great creatively. Uh, so who has better skills for life, right? In functioning well in business. How many of the smartest people that you knew in college are struggling? Or how many of the smartest people that you worked with really aren't doing that well? Because a lot of this stuff doesn't carry over to real life. It's great to have, right? I wish I had a super high IQ. I don't. Um, but there's other things that are more important. And so the world's been focused a lot on this in the brain. But what really a smart brain is are these things. These are things a computer can't do yet, maybe someday. But even IBM Watson can't do a lot of this stuff. And we've done work with IBM Watson to try to blend what we're doing with them to see if we can make computers do some of this stuff. But planning, reasoning, novel thinking, decision making, judgment, and managing emotions, those are all the things you want to have a better grasp of, and you want your teams and the people that work for you, and probably your bosses to have, have a better grasp of, right? Computers do this. Why should, our brain, why should we waste our brains doing that? This is, this is where the, the meat on the bone is. And that's what we've been focused on at the Center for Brain Health, is how can we engage our brains to do these sorts of things and not get stuck in the rote world of this. Uh, and this area, by the way, is called the frontal lobe of your brain, and that is where all these things happen. So what we're trying to do is figure out, are there ways that we can help people engage this part of their brain to result in higher performance in these areas that have physical changes in the brain, psychological changes to, to how you live your life, and then real life outcome measures in terms of productivity and just real life quality of life. And uh, after about 20 years of work, they came up with something um, pretty interesting, which I'm gonna share with you. But one of the big takeaways are, is, is that your brain is, is much more modifiable than any other part of your body. So you break a bone, you heal it, and, it, and it, the bone grows back, right? You, you scrape something on your skin, it grows back. You get a concussion, most of the time, your brain grows back fine. Not all the time. But your brain is changing real time all the time. From the time that I started speaking to the time that I'm done speaking, your brain will have changed. You have neurons and you have connections between the neurons. Those are changing real time all the time. And that just kind of blew me away. You can't see that, 
right? It's not like a broken arm where it's so obvious or your scrape, but they can see it in MRI machines, and it's going on real time, and they call it plasticity. So brain plasticity is an emerging field in brain health, and so people are trying to take advantage of the brain's great ability to show plasticity to enhance performance of the brain. So what, what we developed at the Center for Brain Health is, uh, uh, if you, how many of you heard of Lumosity before? You've, so that's, that's a great thing. That's more of a, the first brain. You know, it's more about you know, memory and focus and attention. It's, it's things that are really nice to have. But this is, the, this is more of a brain training program that's, that's developed to uh, engage your frontal lobes, which does the, the critical thinking part of your brain. And so there's, your brain is in a whole lot different than a computer in, in, the, in the things that it does. It, it takes in information, it does something with it, it analyzes it, and then it makes meaning from it. And so our scientists figured out a way on each step of the way, how can we consciously use our brain in a more proactive way to perform higher in all these areas. Because a lot of us, if you're like me, you get stuck in a lot of areas. You may never get to the creativity part because you get stuck here in too much information or you get stuck here in, 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 in too much of a rote mode. So I'm gonna, I'm gonna give you some tips in a few minutes on kind of some of the things that we're doing. So we put people, uh, we started back in the, in the 80s first with kids with ADD and we've gone into kids with ADD, healthy kids, uh, uh, military people with post-traumatic stress, traumatic brain injury, healthy adults that are aging, bipolar, probably 30 or 40 different uh, population sets, both healthy, injured, and diseased, and done this brain training program and where we taught people how to use it. And we said, okay, what are the outcomes? So uh, the first, until five years ago, all I could do was kind of check the box, you know, do I feel better, are you performing better? in certain areas, but the MRI technology has changed dramatically. In the past five years, the software has advanced where you can see things in the brain today that you couldn't see five years ago. So um, here's what, what we can see, and uh, without trying to read what these are saying is that these are all good things. This is your frontal lobe activity up here before, during, and after training. So the more colors, the better. So physically, the brain is changing. And this is not like why you're thinking. This is a, a, a afterward, like six, this is six months after. So they went through the training here. Here they're in the middle of the training. This is six months after, and they're using the strategies. Over here, blood flow is everything to the brain. Blood flow to the frontal lobes increased dramatically before and after training. And uh, they said blood flow on average increased uh, 8%. And I said, well, that doesn't mean anything to me. Is 8% like good, bad? Um, great, and, and they just said, it's, it's awesome. I said, so you mean it's like jump up and down the hallways, high five, chest bumping to each other exciting? They said, yes. So that 8% is huge. That's like regaining, I believe, 20 years of that cognitive decline back after doing this training. And the last thing is, um, this is your frontal lobe where the critical thinking is done. This is where your memory center is they saw strengthening in the connections between these two. Because a lot of times you have the memories are here, right? This is your CP unit of your computer. It's getting them up here where you can remember the darn thing. And they saw stronger connections in there. Um, so physical changes are what the scientists get excited about. I get more excited about, okay, that's great, that's cool. I don't really understand those pictures at all, but I wanna know is it really helping these people in their lives? And you can see the, the complex reasoning goes up uh, memory goes up, and then increase in daily life activities, that's a quality of life outcome. And then psychological health, 58% uh, decrease in depression and stress, that's huge. All by just using your brain in a better way. Unfortunately, I tell people, God gave us a brain, but he didn't teach us how to use it. We are not using our brains in the right way, and it's creating stre un uh, extra stress. And when I've gotten a, the, uh, the blessing of meeting a lot of people that served our country in the military and they come back pretty messed up. And one of the biggest problems they have is sleep. You know, imagine if you can't sleep at night, how miserable your day is, even if you're just happy, right? You know, if you didn't have to deal with all that. And they come away and they say, What's, what do you think about, we call our training SMART. It's a cute acronym for some complex term. Some complex terms. Um, and um, they said, I slept, I had my best night's sleep since I came back from combat duty. 
And that's, that really is the step in the right direction for them to say, hey, this, there's some hope for me. Uh, so uh, that's, that is a big, big deal. And it's not, a, it's not a depression program. It's not a sleep program. These are just the outcomes that we're measuring. And obviously, uh, depression and um, stress uh, is, is real important. So I'm going to give you some tips now, and I'll, and I'll leave plenty of room for questions uh, afterwards if you guys have any. So um, just take you real quickly through what, we're, what, what the steps are. So um, filtering and focus, that is the information that you take in. So the, the, you, have, you have emails, you have conversations, you have text, you have things you're reading, you have all kinds of information you're taking in. So how do you take that in? How do you decide what to focus on? How do you filter out what's not needed? Okay, If you put your brain on autopilot, it's going to do a really bad job of that. Really bad. At least I do. Maybe you guys are smarter than me. But it, generally, your brain is going to do a really, really bad job of that. The next thing is you're going to do something with it. And you can look at it from the most, we call it zoom in, is the facts, you know, more the rote. You know, if you're looking at a project management, looking at your, your timing and all that stuff, what are the facts of it? And then if you, we call it zooming out is, OK, what is the meaning of it? And then, and then uh, the zoom wide and deep is how do we make, make, be more, much more strategic about how we're thinking about it. And I'm a finance guy, so I default to zoom in mode. I'm a numbers guy. Uh, if you give me a letter to type, I guarantee you it'll come out with 10 typos and look like a third grader did it. But if you give me numbers, I'm, that's what I'm good at. I love spreadsheets. I love digging into numbers. So after I went through this brain training program, I learned to, to step out of that being my default mold and not dive into the numbers and first think about the bigger picture. Now, you might be already be a bigger per picture person, and you not, I might need to go back into the details more. So when we go in and do our training for law firms, they're great at details. They need to zoom out. When we go into uh, public relations firms or advertising firms that are more creative in nature, they hate details. But they're really good at the zooming out part, but they need to sometimes get into the details. So being able to toggle between those three things is what we teach people to do. And I mentioned that the real meat on the bone was the frontal lobe, but the best bites are right here. Our brains were wired to be inspired, and the more we can engage it in a creative and novel way, the more productive it's going to be. And by the way, the more you're going to remember. We've shown this in kids in low-income schools. We, we, are, we are in the worst schools in Dallas right now in middle school, where the graduation rates are, are one school, I think, was 19%. Uh, so the average first kid in middle school, 19% of them went on to um, to uh, graduate from high school. And we're teaching these kids these strategies. And their standardized test scores and their grades are going up so dramatically that the first class we did in seventh grade, they've now graduated. And they've, that, gra that, that first class had 89% graduation rate. And they had to create AP classes for the school because they didn't have any because no one wanted to take them for this class. So it's pretty cool. <laughs> now, we've done this for over 50,000 kids now. And of course, like. Our donors are coming in saying, this is great for your kids, but my kids are having the same problems. I'm like, great, it's going to cost you money. <laughs> and we can use that money and uh, pay for the kids that, that can't, afford, can't afford it. Um, and the key has been is get the kids engaged in what they're learning and make them want to learn it and not memorize it. You know, It's blocking out. They get, there's so much they have to just blocking out. My daughter's got, the reason she struggles, she's got major ADD. And I paid for her to go through the program. And once she learned how to block out you know, 80% of what she didn't have to memorize, she just felt this huge sigh of relief because she'd look at something and say, I've got to memorize everything. And the teachers don't guide them any other way. So uh, it's, and she's, a, she's naturally good at, at, the, at the creative side, but she could never get there because she was so stuck on the other parts up here on the top part of the curve. So uh, let's talk about it, taking in information. So uh, again, with our SMART acronym, we like to come up with cute things so people can remember us, because that's how the brain works. So we call it the, the brain power of none. And that means take, your brain was not meant to work 8 to 10 hours a day nonstop. Interval training and, and physical exercise is considered the best way to, to gain, get in better shape exercise-wise. Your brain likes to work in intervals as well. You've got to take breaks. 
And uh, so we um, have this thing called the Fab Five, is take five five-minute breaks a day. 90 minutes is generally the rule of thumb. If you can go hard for 90 minutes and then take a five-minute break and then go back hard, that is the best way to work your brain. If you try to fight through those moments, at least I find myself highly unproductive during those fight through moments. So just take a break, take a walk, um, meditate, uh, go engage in a conversation with someone. I like to check uh, like People Magazine type stuff where I don't have to think. You know, I like so I know everything about the Kardashians, but it's relaxing to me. <laughs> it's stupid but relaxing. I don't have to think about anything. So however you decide to do it, and, and know your brain. So I am not very productive between 2.30 and 4.30. And so I take an extra long break. I just, and I just, I used to think, well, that's not how the business world works. You have to work from eight to five or eight to six or nine or whatever you do. And you can't just go stop working for an hour um, because my brain's not working. Well, guess what? I do it. But my brain works really well from six to seven at night. So I can get, a, so I took up an hour off during the middle of the day where I would be unproductive and then added a highly productive hour to my life that works with my family schedule. So know your brain. And you might be a morning person. You might be a night person. One of my part, business partners, he gets to work at 11 o'clock, and he works till 10 o'clock, and he goes to bed at 2, 2 a.m. That, that works for him. But he's one of the most productive people I know. Now, sometimes I know you have work where maybe that isn't, your bosses may not like that. But know your brain. There's tweaks you can make to go about your day. And I mentioned mindfulness uh, used to be something that um, Buddhists did in Asia, and people thought it's kind of neat, but scientists didn't give it any credibility. There's been a lot of science that's come out that, that meditation, mindfulness is highly productive for your brain. If your brain is not prepared, this is think of it as preparing your brain to work. If your brain's stressed and not relaxed and not in a mode of taking information, you're going to do all kinds of bad things. So if you do one thing leaving here, I would say create some sort of mindfulness practice. I'm not very good at meditation. Uh, I like to play the guitar. I'm not good at it. But if I strum my guitar for five minutes, I find that I, it really relaxes me a lot. So you got to find your own thing, right? Um, hopefully, it's not taking a cigarette break. <laughs> uh, OK, now your brain is, let's assume you're doing a good job, your brain's relaxed, you're prepared to take in information. Now information's coming in. So we call it the brain power of one is that our brains cannot multitask, but yet our society tells us that multitasking is good. So let me differentiate between sequential tasking and multitasking. So doing 10 things in a row, finishing one at a time is great, but doing 50% of one thing, going to the second project, going back to the first project, and back and forth is bad, really bad. It's highly inefficient. It's no different than saying, OK, I need to go to Walmart. Well, that's not a good example because they sell groceries now. I got I to I gotta, I gotta go to Macy's, and I have to go to the grocery store. And you go get a few groceries at the grocery store, and then you go to Macy's to get things you need, and you go back to the grocery store, and then you go back to Macy's and back. That's what you're doing with your brain when you multitask. It's stupid, but we all do it, and people they, they're proud to be multitaskers, but if you saw your brain in an MRI machine on multitasking, you'd never do it again. It looks like an atomic bomb went off. It's just bad. So when I say multitasking, boo, you're never going to stop doing it. Sandy Chapman, who's the head of the Center for Brain Health, she's been doing this research for almost her whole career. She multitasks, and she always says, I'm a recovering multitaskaholic. But she doesn't do it near as much as she used to. So I'm not saying never multitask. That's not possible. That's like saying never eat a cheeseburger or, or anything bad. But minimize the multitasking. So, so boo multitasking, yay sequential tasking, and wow for blocking. And that is just taking out the stuff you don't need. right? I have a real big problem with that, where I feel like I have to take in and remember everything that comes in. You don't have to do that. Think about what's really important. What we do with kids is that you know, traditionally, uh, you give them a highlighter. Highlight the most important things in this paper. And uh, now what we do is we give them black Sharpies and say, take out the stuff that's not important. OK, so you've got to create that mental sharp black Sharpie in your brain and take out the stuff that doesn't matter. Because you got so much noise in there, you're not prepping your brain to get to the point where it can think critically if you got noise. So if you're not relaxed, 
and you're not, and you've got too much information in there, you don't stand a chance. And guess what? I think most of us live 90% of our days in that mode. So the other things, who's seen the King's Speech? So a lot, a lot of people, have seen, you know, I'm going I'm to analogize the, this to the King's Speech, but there's two levels of information I mentioned. Zooming in is the details and the facts. Zooming out are the themes, and wide and deep is meaning. So if I were to, when you ask a group of people, um, you know, what the King's Speech is about, you know, sometimes you'll get, you know, is overcoming a stuttering problem. Well, that's very correct. It's very factual. Um, but... Some people might say, well, it's about fear, adversity, pressure, grit. You know, over, um, it's a little bit more broader themes. That's better, right? It's, not, it's less factual and more about the themes that came out. But the real, real juice in your brain is, OK, so this guy's got a stuttering problem. Where are my problems in my life and I'm avoiding? And how can I, where do I need to confront this in my life? And so the more you're here, the more up here is firing. OK, so if you're down here, parts of your brain are firing. If you're over here, more parts of your brain are physically firing off, and more blood flow is going up to that frontal lobe. And the more blood flow that goes up there, the stronger it gets physically. That just blows me away, that you can think yourself to being stronger. But it's true. And so what, again, I, I mentioned this. We, we give people strategies and teach them how to do this. But I think that when you look at your projects and your work, think about this. You know, where am I? Do I default here? Do I default here? Or am I lucky enough to default here? But there are people that are up here all the time that maybe you've worked with. They're up here in La La Land thinking about the future, but you know, they're, they're missing the point down here. It's that ability to toggle in between here and um, uh, to really be able to have, function high in life. There was this lawyer that uh, I met one time when I was really young. He was 25 years old, and he looked like he was 45 years old. And he was a tax lawyer, and he called the, his nickname was The Code, because it's a thing called the Internal Revenue Code. And he could cite the Internal Revenue Code. He would sit in meetings, and he would, could cite everything off the top of his head if it related to the subject. He was brilliant. People thought he was the most marvelous thing in the world. He probably even had a cute girlfriend. He was so smart. But he looked, he looked like he was 20 years older than he was. He sweated profusely. He was heavily overweight. Here, he was a genius. Now, if you asked him, OK, thank you for citing that to me. Tell me what that means, he'd shut up. I don't know where this guy is today. It's nice to have that. You need some of that. But if you're stuck here, I mean, he physically was not a healthy person. And there's other people that are like that as well. So I use that as an example because I, I just remember the code and how much we all want to be like the code, when the reality is we don't want to be like the code. We want, I want to be up here. So change your thinking about you know, this, these genius IQs. Combine this genius stuff down here of being great at this with this, and then you really got something. So um, I mentioned that our brains are wired to be inspired. I don't know if you feel it when you guys are, when you're working or talking to other people, but you know, when you do, learn something new or do something creative, there's literally a chemical that gets released into your brain that makes you feel happy and feel good. And it's, you probably can think of examples of that. But literally, there's a chemical. Your, 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 our body has more chemicals in it than any pharmacy does. The well, problem is, is we can't get them to the right spots at the right time. And that's one of the things that, that scientists are working on is how do we get these chemicals to the right spots at the right time. So we have antidepressants in our body that are just not called antidepressants, but they're just stuck many times uh, uh, you know, in our gut, and it goes up through into your brain. And it's fascinating to learn this stuff, but it's pretty, pretty amazing. But, but one of the th great things is that there, for most people, I wouldn't say for everyone, but for most people, learning something new, thinking of a creative idea, coming up with a solution, really, really engages chemicals in your brain. It just makes you happy. And that, 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 if you do that enough, it makes you more creative. It's just like if you do enough curls, your bicep's going to get bigger. If you think creatively enough, your brain's going to get better at thinking creatively. And this we call, you know, 10 years ago would have been science fiction-y. That would have been a science fiction statement. But now we call it science faction because we proved it scientifically. Um, a couple things that, that I think that I've learned about what are important qualities to have from a, 
uh, to, to be your best self when it comes to thinking at this highest level is to have a fascination with curiosity and a fascination with learning. So the code guy who was a knower, uh, maybe I was just jealous of the code. That's why I brought him up because he knew so much. I don't know. But you know, the more curious you are and the more you want to learn from other people versus being the guy that's the expert in the room, that's really what's going to engage your brain at this highest level. Now, you need to know stuff, right? People are paying you to know stuff. But to be a lifelong learner and to be really curious about stuff, that is where I'm really seeing the highest performers. And I've been lucky enough to work with a lot of successful people in my career. And I'll tell you that most of them are not very traditionally smart. But they're highly curious, definitely a learner, and they're actually also very good in, in dealing with people. They have really good uh, so emotional intelligence as well. Uh, so this curiosity part I, in, the, in the learner versus knower mindset, um, we found, uh, and I've been in the investment business for a long time, that there's a, uh, CEOs that <clears throat> are learners um, uh, have a much higher probability of being successful than ones that are knowers. And I can show you the statistics for that, but I'm not going to talk to you about that. But that's, that's kind of one takeaway we've taken in the business world is, is we actually measure CEOs and companies we invest in. Are they lower, learners or knowers, or where do they fit in the spectrum? Because if they're all knowers, we, we don't invest in them. Uh, now, the good news about all this is we can do something about it. Um, bad news is, is you can't go to the gym for 30 to 45 minutes a day and fix it. It's something you have to incorporate in your day. Now, the really good news is, is that it's not additive to your life. If you're using your brain in a different way, but not an extra way. So uh, we're, all the strategies that we teach people, it's changing how they're using their brain, changing practices during the day. It's not adding new things you have to do to your day. So if you go through our brain training program and you, and you learn all this stuff and you don't use it, uh, and we've seen the, we, we, the high adopt, the, the average adopter had 8% increase in brain blood flow. The people that were low adopters of the strategies had no meaningfully increase in blood flow, and the high adopters had 18% increase in blood flow. So this is stuff you have to use. You can't learn it. Like Lumosity is go in, do this thing for 30 minutes, and you're done, and it changes your brain. Ours is this is incorporating new habits in your day. So we use that as a fitness analogy that um, this is something that you want to do as much as you can during the day. So implications to what you guys do is uh, obviously productivity and stress management, critical thinking, decision making, problem solving, innovation, creativity. I think those are all things that you guys would like to have more of in, in your workspace. We're seeing organizations um, want this a lot. Uh, because of they know that something's not right, right? They know there's something they could be doing more. You know, wellness is becoming more important, and uh, they're seeing a lot of pe the the biggest cause of disability is, is stress related, right? Especially in the in professional services, it's not you know cancer or anything like that. It's people just stressing out, and they can't work. Um, Management tools, you know, I change the way I manage my day, how I think about my projects, how I conduct meetings, and how I manage my people. Not dramatic changes, uh, but I change literally the way I conduct meetings with people that get me out of zoom in mode and, and get me into zoom out mode. And I have, I feel, uh, I've been doing it for about five years, and I feel like I am so much less stressed after a meeting now, because I, 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 instead of having a, I was more of a, probably a, probably lean towards the knower side in these meetings. <laughs> and um, I would get into details, and, and we come out with a good solution. But I was driving a lot of it, and it was exhausting. And when I switched how I did things, most of the time, the guys left the room with their own answers, and I just kind of helped guide them to that answer. And I wasn't able to do that until I had the context of these strategies, because my mind just defaulted to, I know what to do, and here's how we're going to do it. Other things to think about, um, I already mentioned the, the analogy to health. Um, it's rewiring is required, so this is something that takes a little bit. You, you'll see benefits right away, but you've got to keep doing it. So uh, if, you, if people engage in these strategies, so if you meditate for really well for three months and then you stop, uh, it's not going to do you much good. So it might help you for those three months and maybe a couple weeks after, but 
when you create a practice, it's something you have to incorporate in your life. But your brain will literally rewire itself, and you will, will feel it. It's, it's pretty remarkable. Other things that are really important to brain health besides these cognitive strategies that have been scientifically proven, sleep is vital. It's a little bit different for everybody, but generally seven to eight hours of sleep. Uh, some people can function fine on four, but most people need seven to eight hours. If you can't, if you're not, if you're tired and your brain's tired, that taking in information, you're, you're going to fail at stage one. So sleep is vital. Exercise is vital as well. Uh, we did a study that combined our training with the Cooper Clinic exercise, and you know, the both together were better than each one separately. So exercise is, again, that's so important for stress management, and that's so important for that your brain being prepared to take in information. I mean, I go to the gym a lot stressed out, but I never leave stressed out. I don't really want to go there all the time, but I've never left the gym stressed out. Nutrition is really important. What you put in your body affects your brain output. So uh, I always think about, my, my trainer calls it the caveman diet. You know, if a caveman couldn't eat it, you shouldn't eat it. You know, don't eat anything in a box. Uh, you can cheat from time to time. Um, my trainer is about a fizz guy, as you'll ever see. I, I, I don't use him that much, as you can tell. But um, he, 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 uh, he has a piece of cheesecake every morning at, at 4 a.m. before a training session because the body burns off fat earlier in the morning. And that, that, so, but he's, he has no body fat on the he's, he's extremely fit. But nutrition is really important. So if you eat bad, some of these cognitive strategies may not work as well. Your brain, I mean, it's fuel for your brain. It's fuel for your body. And you've got to eat right. And uh, there are, there's no scientifically proven best way to, to eat. But in general, it's common sense, right? Pasta and bread, pasta and cheese, garlic bread probably aren't the best thing to eat for your brain, right? Fruits and vegetables and grilled fish probably are, right? And they are. Um, so that's, that's really important as well. And I mentioned science fiction before because uh, the future to me is more exciting than the past because the stuff that's going on in the brain world is just ridiculously interesting. It's, it, it's like Star Trek to me. And a lot of it's being done here up here in UT Dallas. UT Dallas has a group that combines neuroscience and engineering. They're making devices that you can put in your body that send those chemicals up to your brain in a, in a, in a more organized fashion that increases the plasticity of your brain. So I know it sounds weird, but I think within 10 years, a lot of us are going to be walking around with chips in our head not to make us computers, or we might have nanobots in our bloodstream that help us with our brain. And it's going on right now. I mean, and the, and the US government actually does a great job with this. They're way ahead of in, to, in, in the science field with a lot of other organizations. There's a, a, a government group called DARPA, which is funded by DOD. And I always tell people that DARPA's group is so strong that Google hires people from DARPA, not vice versa. I mean, they have the best of the best, and so they, they've got, you know, most prosthetics are muscle movement prosthetics. They've developed one where you can think, and, and the prosthetic doesn't even have to be attached to your body, and it'll move. Just blow, if you saw it, it'll blow you away. you think someone was pulling a stunt on you. But the stuff that's going on right now, so instead of blasting our brains with antidepressants if we're depressed, or tons of stimulants if, we, if our kids have ADD, Imagine if we could just isolate the real part of your brain. Because they, they know today, we know exactly the part of brain that creates anxiety. And they can tickle it for a few minutes and take away that anxiety for 30 to 45 minutes. But it, it, it doesn't do any good to, want, to be de not depressed for 30 to 45 minutes. You want to be better for a longer period of time. So we're making strides. So I think you're going to see some incredible, incredible things come out. They're just going to blow your mind away. That's not a good analogy. It's going to blow your mind to happiness. <laughs> By the way, I was, uh, I, work, I told you I got to work with a lot of military people. And I like to say, blow, this blows me away. I don't know why. I just like that term a lot. And it's not a good term to use for military guys, because a lot of them come in, and they've been actually been blown up. So I get to laugh with them, because um, they're so appreciative of the help that we've, we've, we've been able to give them. Um, so I'm just a steward for this. I didn't do any of the science, so I can help you. I can answer some questions, but I'm not a scientist. I just, I just gleaned this from my past four years learning. Uh, the Center for Brain Health is part of University of Texas, Dallas. 
It's, up, it's down by uh, UT Southwestern uh, off of Mockingbird Road. It's been around since 1999. Bunch of neuroscientists, fairly geeky people that work weird hours and fall asleep at their desk. But they're really, really smart and really good at what they do. And uh, we're one of the leading brain research organizations in the world, literally. We are globally known. We've attracted scientists, two, two international scientists recently to move here uh, from different parts, of the, different parts of the world. And uh, we're, in, we're, we're just very, very well known. And I joined to help them launch the Brain Performance Institute because right here is the valley of death. Great research. Does it go filed away in a piece of paper? Or does it get out to the public? And we created this, and we're building a building next door. This is the Center for Brain Health. And we're halfway done with construction of this building. Research here, open to the public here. And that'll be open in, in about a year. Uh, so, so far, what we've been able to do is we, uh, we focus on health. Injury and disease, I'd say most of the work we do is with healthy adults because we think that's where the most opportunity is because most of us are healthy. Talk about Alzheimer's. 87% of us are never going to get Alzheimer's. 13% will, but let's not focus just on the, on the 13% that are going to have problems. Let's, let's focus on the 87%. People aren't doing that. We are. Uh, I mentioned the military. I mentioned education. We've done a lot of work in concussions, and we're seeing a lot of organizations want us to come in and do it. Uh, what, what happens is, is we'll go into a corporation or a university with their militaries and offer it for free because we have funding, philanthropic funding or state funding. And they'll say, well, Joe that served in the Marines, he, he's a much better performer today than he was six months ago. And I asked him why, and he said it's because of the Center for Brain Health. And like, I want that for my, my senior management team. Or uh, Texas Tech Law School said, uh, two of my law school students were in the military, and they were bottom performers, and now they're setting the curve on the grades. What happened to them? I want that for all my law school students, and they're willing to pay, so that's good. So we've been able to reach 50,000 people uh, with mostly our, high, our this smart training, but we have, other, we have other programs as well. We actually have a program for, with kids with autism. Kids with autism uh, will not do not want to sit with a human being and be taught smart. It freaks them out to be around people. So we created avatars that look like themselves and an avatar for the clinician. And the clinician's in a different room, and they interact with uh, an avatar, and it works great. Uh, we're not just trying to focus on Texas. Uh, we've been in 17 different states. Uh, we can do our work. In, uh, all we need is a conference room and, uh, and a PowerPoint machine, and, and we can do it. We don't need machines. Uh, when we do scanning, obviously we need machines, but most of it we don't do scanning. So we've been all over the place. Uh, the, the first training we did out of state, uh, one of my uh, guys that was in, was in the Navy, uh, we literally did the, the smart training on a catamaran off of Florida. I'm like, how did you pull that off? I didn't get to go, right? I, don't, I can't do the training. I was like, that is crap. I can't believe you're doing it on a boat off Florida. I need you to go to like Albuquerque or something like that. Hopefully no one's from Albuquerque. Um, or St. Louis, where I'm from. That's not glamorous either. So we've been in a lot of different states and continue to do more. Uh, believe we are, um, we tried to get into the military more from an injury perspective, and that's been relatively hard because of bureaucracy, but the special forces love it because they're all about performance. You know, the, the Navy SEALs or the Army Rangers, the Marine Special Forces, they're like, if there's a $100,000 knife that's the best knife in the world, they're going to get it. They don't have budgets. You know, if there's the best technical vest, I mean, they get the best of everything. So they're all about performance. We've been, there, there's a big Navy SEAL base here, and there's one here, and there's actually a boat uh, base down in, uh, excuse me, in, in, um, in Hawaii. And we've been to all three of them like four times training their special forces, not for injury, but for preparation for battle. And it's really cool because they're, they're like, they taught us physically. Like the, the joke in the, in the SEALs are that if there's one structure up uh, in, in Afghanistan or wherever they're at, it's going to be a gym because they, they're physically from the neck down strong. And uh, we've talked to guys that have broken their back three times lost limbs, and they go back and fight, and they know that the government can rebuild their body, but they're scared to death about their brain. And the fact that we can better prepare their brain for combat is really cool, and so they, they're really, really into it. And 
there's not a bigger bunch of type A people in the world than <laughs> Navy SEALs. Wow, these people are intense. Um, but so if they like it, it's kind of like Mikey from Live Serial. Anyone will like it. Uh, I told you, this is our building. Uh, I told our architects that we need iconic on a budget. We can't, we're not for profit. We can't spend a lot of money, but we got to build something really cool that people are going to notice. And then when you go inside, it doesn't feel like you're going in for treatment. No one wants to go get their brain messed with. This is about performance. We actually called this the Brain Performance Institute because the Navy SEAL said, if you call it the Brain Treatment Clinic, I ain't showing up. <laughs> but I know what you do. So when you walk in, it's going to look like a uh, it's going to be a learning environment, and and, it's, and the the people you meet and, and how we treat people is very much, how do we make your brain perform better, not treat you like a victim, and how can we um, fix what's wrong with you? Uh, Ross Pro Jr. likes this, so that's cool, right? So he came in, brought his senior leadership team. He's a big supporter of ours and, and uh, you know, really used what, what we taught him for a lot in his business. Um, how, can, how can you learn more? Um, our website's awesome. It's like Internally, if we want to find something, we go to our website. <laughs> we, uh, so if you want to read articles or just get information about the brain and all that, go to our website. It's really neat uh, and useful. Um, we have programs that we offer for organizations, if you guys are interested. So we have something called a lunchtime brain health, where we it's 90 minutes and teach people a little bit about how to use their brains healthier. I think we charge like $1,500 for that. We have the full high-performance brain training. I think we charge like 15,000 for that, up to 25 people. And then we have individualized brain health assessments that are $600 a person. And, and we're using these, these organizations to help us fund the military and the kids in low-income schools and just you know, parents that can't afford it. Um, we're about 50-50 kids versus adults. Uh, Sandy Chapman, who uh, is the almighty leader of the Center for Brain Health, uh, she wrote a book a few years ago that has a lot of the tips um, called Make Your Brain Smarter. It's a great book. It's about 100 pages of the strategies, and then it's got the rest of it's like individualized to your demographic. You pick your age group or maybe what's, what you want to focus on. So it's a pretty quick read, and it's a great introduction. If you're curious about how your brain works, this is my favorite. I've, I've read like 50 in the past three years. This, this book right here, Thinking Fast and Slow, is the most non-scientific, layman's term, fascinating read on how your brain works, and the bottom line is how bad our brains are pre-wired to work if we don't do something about it. If I mentioned meditation, um, that's really, really important. Uh, if there's one thing you walk away and do is, is take those brain breaks and create some sort of mindfulness practice. Um, there's a couple apps out there, uh, Headspace and Calm. I use Calm, um, but Headspace is a more introductory thing. And there's tons of apps. There's probably 100 of them. But those are the two that our scientists like the best. Um, so with that, I don't think I have anything else. Um, thank you for your time. And um, I don't know how much time we have for questions. Or well, am I supposed to take questions? Just don't ask me anything like technical about like parts of the brain. So I can't answer that. Do I need to repeat? No, repeat I heard you. I heard you. Yeah, so system, I'm just curious. System one is rote, not really just reacting versus being proactive, and system two is more critical thinking, being proactive about how you're using your brain. Right. And that's the gist of his, his book. Right. So the question is, I, I know you're not in the science part of it uh, all the time, but what have you heard about that type of, uh, you know, separation of the brain? Is it truly that independent, or how, to, how, to, how do you get your emotional side in your frontal lobe thinking to, to work better with it's each other. It's really practice and awareness. That's why the meditation is so important to create more awareness around. Uh, it's if you're subconsciously using your brain, you're going to stay in system one, more rote. If you're consciously using your brain more proactively, you're going to enter into system two. From the separate separateness, I'm not. I would I would think that most scientists would say that it's it's everything's together and it's not really 
you're either in here or you're not either in system one or in system two. You're toggling back between the two all the time, and they work together. It's just that he, he just mentioned that as a, as a key dynamic of brain function, that if you stay in system one, here's your output. If you're able to engage in system two, here's your output, and system two's output's going to be a lot better. But our brains have been rewired for thousands of years to work on system one, because that's what it needed most to survive. So until the past 200 years, we haven't needed system two as much. For improving concentration and creativity, what specific exercises do you recommend? Concentration? And creativity, what specific exercises do you recommend? So the, um, the creativity is, uh, one of the things that we do is uh, we show someone a picture. Let's, let's, let's say you um, um, go, go to an art museum and, and look at a piece of art, uh, discuss with whoever you're with or yourself all the different interpretations of that art. What could that art mean? Versus just looking at it, either you like art or don't. I'm kind of neutral. I'm sort of get it and sort of don't. You know, why is Andy Warhol's painting of a can worth $10 million? I don't know, but my friend who's in art says it's worth that, so I'll believe him. But there's different interpretations. You know, what I do is kind of, I let my daughter, I mentioned the Kardashians, you guys are going to think that I'm crazy, but my daughter, loves, my daughter loves keeping up with the Kardashians, but I make her talk about the themes she learned from the Kardashians afterwards. And we talk about that. Sometimes it's a minute and sometimes it's 10 minutes. So we're engaging our brain to be thinking. Um, and in terms of focus, that's not really something that we uh, spend time on. It's really more preparing the brain so it can focus. And the, I think the best exercise for that is filtering out a lot of the information that you don't need. And I would say one simple thing, if you haven't already done it, is turn off your email notifications. Uh, I move my computer from right in front of me to behind me, and people thought that I was like Christopher Columbus. <laughs> like, why would you do that? And, and you know, I, they didn't have the dings, and I wasn't distracted by it. And so just... You can focus a lot better if you don't have the distractions. That would be the main thing. And, um, and it's really hard because our brains want that distraction. We want it. I want it. Um, I want it bad. But <laughs> how do we stop doing it, right? Because uh, it's not good for you. I have two questions, if I may. Um, the first one is, how do you get to know your brain? And the second one is, um, you mentioned middle schools but how would an educator in a low-income high school get to speak with someone and have them talk to her or his class? Okay, so the, um, on, your, on your second question, so we're, we, we have kind of a grassroots effort on, on dealing with schools where we just we get connected with school administrators. Oftentimes the principal or a teacher might bring it. So if, if you have someone in mind, we would love to talk to them, and you can reach out to me and I'll connect you with the person that's, that's head of our programs for that. So we don't have a process or a formal grant application. It's more of a grassroots, hey, we, like, we schedule these, these schools and we try to book them out usually nine months in advance. And we'll train the teachers, not the students. The teachers train the students, but we're out there with the teachers. So the teachers come to us for a week in the summer and they, we go out to the school with them the second week and then we stay out there for a couple months to help them incorporate the training into their class. But we, anyone's able to, to get access to it, it's just a matter of timing and, and getting connected with the right person, but I can do that. And the second one was, it was um, um, the first question was. Um, How do you get to know your mind? Okay, How you just gotta pay, you gotta pay attention to where, when you're not productive and when you are productive, when do you think best. And, and I would say you, you, journaling at the end of the day helps. Um, uh, journaling kind of sounds girly to some of the guys in the room, but journaling is so important. I find that the more I, if I reflect on the day for a few minutes and I write it down, it, it just helps me so much. Uh, I was in the investment business when, when in 2008 when the bottom fell out and it was so stressful. And if I didn't meditate and journal every night, I would have gone crazy. I mean, I wish I meditated and journaled today as much as I did then, but I needed it for survival. But to answer your question, I think you just have to create awareness and accept it. 
right? Don't say, well, I'm not a morning person, but I need to be a morning person. If you're not, you're not. But you've got to create some awareness and notice trends, and I think, the, I think the best way to do that would be to write it down, maybe at the end of the day. Okay, when, did I, when do I feel my best? When do I feel my worst? And just manage around that. Or when do I think I need breaks? And just do it. And don't fight it, because you can't fight through it. Um, how do you foresee the nature of the traditional uh, nine to five in a cube <laughs> changing? And how can you get organizations to embrace a new way of thinking about that? Yeah, that's, that's a really good question and difficult one to answer because I don't know. Because, you know, it's right now it's cool to have cubes in open workspaces, but it's not good for the brain. That new building that we're building will have zero open spaces except collaboration. Everyone will have an office. The architects kept trying to put cubes and workspaces in, and we kept taking them out. And they're like, what are you doing? They're like, we don't want any, and the Center for Brain Health has no open spaces either. It's all, you need privacy. So, but we'll even go into corporations and saying, it's okay to have those workspaces, but at least give people a private place to go if, if and they're starting to, to do that. But it's, right now, the, it's commonly accepted that open workspaces are the way to go. Uh, but scientifically, that's not accurate at all. It's, it's privacy. And uh, so we, a lot of times we'll go into companies and they'll have open workspaces. And after we meet with them, they'll create three or four private rooms that people can go to when they need private time. And that seems to work pretty well for them, rather than tearing down their complete office space and rebuilding. And you, you, you mentioned you were making another good point, but how do we get people to, you know, this nine to five mentality? Uh, I think it's changing some, but it's, it's, it's got a little ways to go. Um, millennials are helping because millennials don't want to work that way. Um, and uh, so embracing, you know, the, the Center for Brain Health embraces that way of working where people, there's some people that show up at 6 a.m. There's some people that show up at noon. It's to get your work done. It's a very hardworking culture, but it's get your work done when your work gets done. Now, if you work for a call center or you're a stockbroker, that might be hard. <laughs> Right, and uh, you have to, or you have, might have to be there. So it's different for different industries. But I think you're seeing some change. But um, I, I, we hope to see more change. I don't know. I don't know how you make the change. It's going to be people from below demanding it. I saw another question. What does the acronym SMART stand for? Uh, that costs twenty thousand dollars. No, it's a. Uh, <laughs> You realize that we came up with the term smart and then had to back into what it meant. So I'll tell you that. <laughs> Strategic memory advanced reasoning training. How about that? <laughs> it is a common saying that an average person utilizes 10% of his mind. Is there any validity in this uh, thought? And uh, what is the uh, what are the ways to improve the, the potential or utilization of the brain? Well, th there's no, nothing scientifically to prove that statement, but a scientist would tell you that that would be optimistic if they were to actually study it, uh, and that they feel like it would be very optimistic if, if, they, if the world even knew collectively how 10% how of what the brain can do and how it works. We are, we are in... I tell people we're kind of in Lewis and Clark stage with the brain. You know, we know there's a lot we know, but you know, we're, we're, we haven't passed the Mississippi yet, right? Where there's a lot we don't know, and so um, uh, we're start, just starting to learn this, like this, this, you know, the system one, system two thinking, the the the, um, the the cognitive training program that we developed, the fact that sleep, nutrition, exercise important is important. For, for brain performance, meditation, mindfulness is important. These are things that five years ago people didn't talk about as being healthy for the brain, and now it's, there's a lot of scientific evidence that would prove it. And it's not like the type of evidence that like, it's going to be like eggs. Well, eggs are bad for you, so don't eat them, and now they're good for you, so you eat them. This is pretty solid evidence that you know, I think going forward there's going to be more momentum behind it that all these things are going to continue to grow. But 10%, it's... it's there's so much we don't know. It's, it's ridiculous. But it'd blow you away if you find out how much we actually do know, but we still don't know a lot. 
Hi, great presentation. Thank you. Uh, question for you. In this mobile age, with everybody basically glued to your cell phone day in, day out, um, I have two young kids, so I'm kind of concerned about them growing up, and is that going to be a negative impact? Um, even for myself, right, you're on a computer, you're on your phone, um, the number of hours you're on a computer. Do you see any negative impacts with the brain or anything specifically you guys are doing to address that? Yeah, the, the, this, it, the, it, it, we, we said the answer to you is technology good or bad for your brain? The answer is um, uh, yes, because it's <laughs> technology is great because it can take away a lot of the rote parts. You don't have to waste your time doing that, and just technology is good. But the distractions that the technology creates is really, really bad for your brain, and it's causing a lot of problems. And there's a great book called What the Internet is Doing to Our Brain. If you want to read another book, it is fascinating. You know, it's the, so the iPhones, Internet, it's rewiring our brain in a bad way. So it's managing it, right? So I love my iPhone. I, my iPad is like an appendage to me. I mean, I panic if I can't, don't have my iPad in eyesight. Uh, literally, I'm not exaggerating, but you know, it's it's how do you manage it? And I still have problems with it, you know, where my son will be talking to me and I'm checking out some stupid thing on the web, and it's like I'm not even there, right? So I'm physically with my son, but not mentally, and um, so uh, it's it's a problem, and we work a lot on it, and it's uh, how do you best manage it? Because it's here, it's not going away, it shouldn't go away, but how do you manage it? You know, do you, do you turn your phone off? You know, so my, my phone's over there and it's off, right? You know, it'd be really easy for it to be here and on vibrate, and then it vibrates three times during my talk. That's not good. Um, so I, we've we've really learned a lot. At least at the Center for Brain Health, we're good about it. We, you know, we're good at turning things off, and we put signs on our door if we want to focus. Um, Uh, it's, I would say that, oh, memory retention. That's, that's the kind of um, the, the $10 billion question in the brain, right? Everyone wants a better memory. And the most common question I get is, okay, I'm 50. I want to remember names better, right? I want to remember facts better. Um, we've seen that it, by engaging the critical thinking parts and the creative parts of the brain, people's memories are a lot better. So that would be the only advice I have for you. Specific to memory, you know, the memory, uh, there's memory enhancing things you can do, but our scientists would say that you're, you're taking up space in your brain that you don't need to, that you have, you have this thing called cognitive reserve. There's only a certain amount of, that your brain can hold. If you're using it to hold too many facts, then you're wasting its ability to do the critical thinking. Um, so I'm not telling you not to, I know it's important to remember because it, it is really important. And if you forget someone's name or a fact, it can be really embarrassing. But we found that, that um, my daughter was able to remember a lot more by thinking critically about things and, and taking out a lot of the unnecessary information. I mean, she had to memorize every capital, no, every country in Africa. And there's a lot of them, by the way. I didn't know there were so many of them. I'm like, why does she have to know this? But but she was able to use the strategies, to, and she, she blocked the, the, she just created this more strategic way of thinking about it, and it, and it um, you know, she was able to memorize it, but I guarantee you she forgot them all. <laughs> um, I was going to make a point about um, memory, but I can't remember. <laughs> <laughs> we good? You can get away with that. <laughs> Yes, sir. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's what, so Asperger's is sort of a subset of the autism spectrum and where we're using those avatars. Um, so Asperger's, mostly in young adults and, and teenagers, we're doing a lot of work in those areas with the, with the Using these strategies, and it'd be it'd be smart on steroids for them, uh, using the avatars. And uh, we had one kid um, that was um, uh, 19 years old and had Aspergers, still has Aspergers, and he was a stock boy at at um, like Target, I think. 
And he went through our program, and now he's an assistant manager dealing with people. So it's pretty cool. Um, that's, the, that's the type of thing where you like to, you know, it, but like I said, we've helped, you know, 25 people over the past two years with that. We'd like to help 25,000 because the autism spectrum is the number of people that fit on that are pretty big. I don't know if I answered your question specifically, but we are doing a lot of work in that area because there's a lot of people that have it. Uh, one last question over here, please. Where are we? Oh, okay. Well, I think what you're saying today is exciting and on point. And my question for you is, when is the Brain Center coming out with its version of luminosity so we can all get better? Yeah. <laughs> so we have, um, we're developed, we have an app that we're going to launch on the iTunes store that's a, a small version of it, of the, of, of the taking in information, but it's only going to be available to people that go through our smart training because it's not ready for prime time yet. So I would say probably one to two years away from that. So we're going to have an e-learning platform, an app, um, but we don't, we're not there yet because we, we, we've been doing things in, the, in these small groups and we don't have the funding yet to, you know, technology is expensive. But it's definitely part of our plan, but I would say that we're at least one year away, probably two years away from having something meaningful. Uh, when we project out how many people we want to help, uh, we think in five years, over 80% of them will reach through technology. They'll never come see our building, right? They're going to do it on e-learning and apps. Right now, we use, I mean, we have a joint study with Yale where we're doing the training virtually using um, um, Skype um, and Adobe something. I'm a technology guy, Adobe something, and they do the scanning there so that people don't have to come here, but that's, we're seeing 20 people a year on that. You know, we want to see 20,000. Okay, all right. Thank you. All right, thank, thank you. you. All right, all right. All right. I have to tell you this, and I'm going to do it because I'm bigger than you. <laughs> I'm going to be depressed. Mom? Early on, you said, when you 25, your brain starts I didn't say it because it was worse. <laughs>